Good afternoon. Welcome to the weekly livestock market update. I'm Brownfield Anchor reporter Megan Grubner with us as always to talk all things markets. University of Missouri, Scott Brown. Good afternoon, Scott. Good afternoon, Megan. We are going to talk trade really primarily is our conversation today. As we get things started, though, let's recap what happened this week in the markets. Yeah, this week in uh, cattle markets, Megan, the, the live fed cattle um, price was was virtually unchanged on the week. And when you look at uh, feeder cattle markets, we really were just slightly tested uh, this week, given it was shortened uh, holiday week. On the choice box beef price, we were down $1.55. That still leaves it uh, $54 above where it was a year ago at this time. And on the hawk side of the equation, barrows and gilts uh, down 65 cents this week. The October lean hog futures contract was down $1.50, and the pork cutout value was up $3.90. And the backtrack to futures for cattle, October live cattle futures contract was up $3.40 this week, and the October feeder contract was up $5.15. I would say that uh, sluggish is probably the word I would use to describe what's going on in the cash hog market. How much of that is seasonality? How much of it is just kind of watching and waiting to see what's going on demand-wise, uh, not just globally, but here at home? Yeah, so I, I I think we are trying to, so number one, there's some seasonality going on here that I think, you know, continues to to, to be not to the positive in terms of higher prices. Uh, but, but at the same time, I think we're all kind of waiting to see what's that Hawks and Pigs report look like at the end of the day and, and where do we go from there? Uh, you know, bit, bits and pieces of information out there that maybe we're reducing uh, the breeding herd, but uh, probably not any great information that that's happening at this point in time. Uh, so, so I think it's a little bit of wait and see here uh, on the supply side. All right, let's talk weekly slaughter. Obviously, holiday shortened week that usually puts us in a, a, a position where we're falling behind. That's really not any different story uh, than we're going to talk about today. Yeah, that's right. So on the cattle side for the week ending September 9th, USDA tells us a run of 559,000 head of cattle. That's 70,000 less than we ran last week and 47,000 less than we ran a year ago. On the hog side, a run this week of 2.234 million head of hogs. That's down 147,000 head from what we did last week and down 18,000 head from what we did a year ago. How are we running when we look at those numbers year over year? Yeah, so on the cattle side, uh, down 4.2% in cattle slaughter year to date, while hog slaughter is up 1.3%. All right, big conversation this week is going to focus on trade. We're going to start with monthly trade data as we take a look at beef and pork exports together. Um, Really, they're telling a completely different story than we've talked about in recent years. Yeah, that's right. We've almost flipped roles for these two meats. uh, relative to what we would have talked about in 2022. Uh, on the beef side, so July 2023 beef exports, 240 million pounds. That's uh, nearly 23% below where we were a year ago in terms of beef trade. Uh, we're really down in, in a number of these countries, the exceptions being uh, sl- uh, slightly higher exports to both Mexico and Canada in the data out for July. Uh, when you look at the year-to-date numbers, uh, we've moved 1.8 billion pounds of beef out of the United States, that is uh, nearly 13% below uh, where we were last year. However, when you look pre-COVID, 2017 to 2019, we're actually up 6.3%. Uh, on the hog side, the other, other side of this equation, so 505 million pounds of pork uh, left the United States in July of 2023. That's 4.2% above where we were uh, uh, relative to a year ago. Uh, and on that side, Mexico and Canada certainly stick out uh, as as two specific countries with growth. I'll say those other emerging countries that that we've talked about for a few months now also showed almost 17% growth uh, relative to where they were a year ago. Uh, Year to date on pork exports, uh, 4 billion pounds, 8.9% above uh, where we were a year ago. There's a couple of things I want to focus on here. One, let's start first. Those emerging markets that we talk about on the pork side of things, how much is it coming into play that these, the investment in growing those markets and investing in growing trade there 
is paying off and, and rewarding uh, the industries as they look at those in the big picture, because I don't think we have pork exports that are 4.2% above where they were a year ago without some of these other markets coming into play. Yeah. So I think this is a great discussion. So when you look at, uh, all right, so when I say all of the markets or I say emerging markets, so let's take China, South Korea, Japan, Mexico, and Canada out of the picture. So it's everybody else after that. Uh, when you look at all those other countries, uh, up 112 and a half uh, billion, uh, million pounds, sorry, I get the right terminology, 112 and a half million pounds more July of 2023 relative to, to 2022. And when you realize um, 504.7 total, and of that 504.7 total exports, 112 and a half being those other countries, it tells you how important they are um, to, to the mix. So I think it's a good price risk management, uh, I shouldn't say price risk, but a risk management strategy that has really been playing well for the hog industry. My other question is, we're seeing a U.S. dollar index that's been up. How much is that coming into play when we think about uh, an export like beef uh, seeing a decline and seeing some pressure here in 2023 combined with the fact that we have less supplies? Yeah, so, so undoubtedly the strength of the dollar is having some impact and perhaps e even pork exports would be higher had we not had a stronger dollar. But, but I think the, the tale of two cities here is is very definitely in the relative prices. So we, we talk about hot lower pork prices this year. So I think that's helped increase trade on the pork side, whereas much higher beef prices have stymied our ability to export a lot of beef. When you look at China down 23% uh, this month relative to last year, uh, South Korea down 26, Japan down 37%. It just, just reminds you that uh, those higher prices, I think, have had an impact on our ability to export uh, beef out of the United States. We didn't get to this a week ago. Quarterly ag trade data we're going to talk a little bit about today. As we take a look at those numbers, Scott, um, kind of run them down, and then we can get into some of the, the, the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah, so uh, I, I think it's always good to start with just reminding us how strong trade has been uh, over the past couple of years. And, and I look at 2020, where we were at $139.7 billion of exports. So that's FY 2020, uh, according to USDA. And by FY 22, we exploded to 196.1. So those last couple of years were really strong. U US, USDA now tells us their projections for FY 24 is a decline to $172 billion by, again, by FY24. So after what's been a really strong climb, it's, it's down for the next couple of years, according to USDA, yet on the import side. Now imports also grew very strongly in 2021 and 2022. In 2020, we were at $143.4 billion. By FY 2022, we were at 194.2. Uh, USDA says we're going to continue to go up to $199.5 billion by FY24. Now, we were a net exporter only slightly in FY22 by $1.9 billion. USDA says we'll become a net importer of $27.5 billion by FY24. And that probably is the largest deficit we would have seen since the start of 2000. I hear a lot of questions and a lot of comments about trade deficits, especially on the um, concerns as it relates to the ag side of things. How does that, how do we switch? How do we go back from being an exporter um, from where we potentially are going to set up as being an importer by 2024? So I, I, I think, you know, one is how do we, so the stronger dollars hurt and I think continues to hurt when you look ahead. So currency's going to matter. Now that's 
not easy for us to fix. Uh, I, at least I don't think. And I think you also have a number of countries where general economic situation continues to not be as strong as it was over the past few years. Um, and, and I think that's at play as well. And again, I'll, re I'll remind us, we started FY 2020 at $139.7 billion of, of export value. So $172 billion in FY24 is still above where we started in 2020. Uh, it, it's hard to continue the rapid growth we saw. And, and again, I just go, we're taking a little bit of reprieve, if you will, from, from some pretty phenomenal growth. Now, maybe more directly to your question of how do we fix it? Um, to, to me, the discussion we had in Fork about these emerging countries is one way uh, to be focused on uh, a, a fix of finding more countries that are interested in um, U.S. ag products and, and grow those uh, as, as best we can. Uh, I'll say the other side of this is we've got stronger competition out there as well. You look at South America and especially on the crop side, uh, you're, you're seeing a lot stronger competition in corn and soybean markets uh, to places like China than, than maybe where we were just a couple of years ago as well. So the competitors matter as well. We might talk about this in terms of Australian beef as, as well. Uh, so it, it, it's a number of factors that drive our export value as well as our import value. It sure seems like it's something that ebbs and flows, right? Like we're going to be a leader sometimes. Sometimes we have to take the bronze medal uh, and, and sit back for a few years. And it seems like that's just kind of the way of the global economy as, as things hinge on drought or a good growing season or a not so great growing season. Yeah. And, and again, sometimes things out of our control, I'll say, you know, when, when we think about being a net importer, I, I go, when our dollar is strong, it makes those goods coming from other places also cheaper for us. So it's, it's not surprising we're seeing some of the, the forecasts out here that would uh, ch change where we've been relative to the last few years. Scott, as we wrap up today, a big supply and demand report coming out next week. How much are you watching what happens with yield, potential yield adjustments and changes from USDA? Yeah, so to me, that's the big question here. I, my, uh, my social media feeds tell me somewhere between zero and uh, 500 bushels is, is going to be corn, and uh, we'll, we'll say zero to 100 on soybeans. There, there are good crops out there, and there are poor crops out there. A lot of volatility, and in, in, in to me, what's a very short geographic area. The, the heat of the last 10 days, to me, seems to be really hurting on the soybean side of the the equation. So I'm I'm really focused. I don't want to be in USDA shoes and trying to do this kind of yield estimates right now, given just the extreme volatility that seems to be uh, out there on the weather side. But that is going to set the stage from a livestock perspective in terms of what feed prices look like. Uh, do, do we move lower, higher as we as we look ahead on feed costs? I, I think we're going to learn a lot. Uh, from USDA out of this next report. I feel like that also sets the stage for potential uh, as producers are looking ahead to 2024 and maybe thinking about wanting to do some retention, maybe bring some cows or some uh, hold some heifers back as well. Um, and there's going to be a lot riding on these next few months in terms of what happens in, for yield for both corn and beans. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll say for the pork industry, um, do we get out of some sow numbers? Uh, those, those feed costs are going to be, I think, what matters at the end of the day of whether we can get ourselves in a less financially challenging situation uh, than, than we've seen for much of this year. It, it may not come from the price side. So cheaper feed may help, uh, help on that front as well. So that, to me, there's some critical things in terms of what happens on the input cost side for livestock producers as we look at. Uh, what kind of corn and soybeans we get in the bin this fall. We'll also touch on retail prices and consumer sentiments. So we'll take a, a quick look at the flip side of things uh, on the demand side as well. That's right. It'll be interesting to see if that demand hangs in there for us for yet another month. Fingers crossed and toast, I think at this point. Scott, it's always great to see you. 
Likewise, Megan. So our weekly livestock market update delivered to your email box every Saturday morning. Go to brownfieldagnews.com. And for a rundown of what happens every day in the markets, make sure to check out John Perkins Market Minute. Have a great weekend. I'm Megan Gretner for Brownfield.